Hey everyone, welcome to Dungeon Hack. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> uh, we're going to be playing through this game together, and I've got at least three videos so far recorded of me playing this game. And I figured it would be fun to take a trip down memory lane with you guys and show this game on my channel. I brought this game up as a topic to talk about very briefly in the Eye of the Beholder series. I talked about it for maybe like three minutes over there because Methodon, one of my viewers, had commented that maybe this game would fit the bill for a party-based first-person dungeon crawling game similar to like The Legend of Grimrock or indeed Eye of the Beholder. My memories of this game are not the best. Although I played the heck out of this game when I was a kid, I think I beat the game like five or ten times and died many, many more times in this game. Uh, this this features a lot of the second edition Dungeons and Dragons uh, mechanics that I dislike. And I remember the game having lots of balance issues between the classes, and I felt that the game was rather repetitious and rather simple. And I called the game terrible, if I remember correctly. Like, this, this is simply not a game I was going to play. And Master of Survival, another commenter, uh, wasn't too happy <laughs> with that take. And uh, I like getting pushback on some of my takes when it comes to different video games. And it's, it's one of the reasons as well why I try to be positive about games and avoid talking about games that I do not have a high opinion of, let alone play them on my channel. So I wanted to be fair and figured that this would, might be fun for us to play together. If nothing else, uh, you can watch me play, see how far I get in it, and you'll get to see the game yourself, rather than maybe just read the comments that Master Survival and I were exchanging to, to each other. And I could play the game again, and try to view it in a better light, based upon what Master of Survival was talking about. So we've just right now created her character. You got to see the stat line that she has. And she looks a lot like Meg Bennett from the Bionic 6 cartoon. So we're totally going to name her that. And I made her a cleric mage because that is, I feel like, one of the strongest character classes that you can run through this game with. Dungeon Hack, it creates a series of random dungeon levels. All it is is a dungeon crawl similar to the original by the Beholder. There's no role-playing in it. There's no conversations to be had. There's no shops to visit. There's no other locations to go into. It's you versus the dungeon and whatever creatures the game spawns on the way down there. Something that I really liked about Dungeon Hack, and it was my first time when I was young ever experiencing it, is this, the customization options. Everything here can be tailored, and I had forgotten the amount of this that could be, uh, well, customized. You don't like the undead draining your levels? Disable undead. You don't want to have to worry about uh, drowning to death in a water level? Disable the water level. You're worried about food and starving to death because you didn't play a cleric? Give yourself very low food consumption and up the amount of food that's available. You want you want your heal spells to heal on that decent amount? Of, this amount? Increase magic power. So, I'm going to talk about each of these options really quickly. Dungeon Depth is how many levels the game will generate. Monster Amount is how many monsters are present on the level to begin with. That does not, to my knowledge, affect the respawn rate. Treasure Amount is how often we will find treasure, creatures that will drop it and or will find it lying around in the dungeon. Food is affects the amount of food that we find. Legionary Walls, how, many, how often these will be present. Legionary Walls look no different from normal walls. We'll talk a little bit about them in the game itself. Key frequency, how often we encounter doors that require keys. Magic traps are special like, uh, areas that, uh, have, that are trapped, obviously. And uh, you can't really avoid these. You just have to suffer through them, if I recall correctly. Pit frequency, you, we all know what pits are. I disable them. Hints are a little like uh, two sentences or one or two sentences which indicate like a hint about a type of creature or like a certain item that you may find and how it's used in the game. Magical zones, I believe, are if a area lets you cast magic or not. I disable the water level. Multi-level puzzles indicate if a key you find on like level 2 might be needed in level 5. So you're going to want to really thoroughly search and hold on to all the keys. Encounter Undead. 
if undead are present or not. Food consumption, how often it is that your food is your food meter begins to decrease. Monster difficulty indicates how much damage the monsters do and how many hit points that they possess. Basically, how often, how much frustration do you want in continually beating on this uh, slug ogre? <laughs> you want to hit it? You want to hit the creature ten times or five times? Like yeah, that's what that meter is. There's a few other meters that I missed because now we're in the game proper, and so, uh, but it's all customization, all customizable. The game features a randomized seed, but you can share that seed with either obviously your other characters or you guys at home if you own this game. You can plug in that seed that you see below, and you'd be able to play a dungeon which is very similar to the one that we are playing. The dungeon seed for this game determines what the layout is, where all the doors are, how the rooms and hallways are laid out. It will be exactly the same. Some items will also be located in the same places. I think that is basically food drops, if I recall correctly, where certain pits and traps are located, and... The grappling hook, where that is going to be located. But the dungeon seed will alter itself slightly, depending upon the type of character class you are playing. We're playing a cleric mage, so we will find cleric and mage scrolls, whereas a fighter would not find these at all, for example. But if you play a cleric mage, I believe you would encounter the same exact creatures and loot as well. That will be the same. And if we lose a character and we plugged in that same seed again, then we could experience the same exact dungeon with everything located in exactly the same places, for example. And yes, there are sound effects in the game, as you can hear. Some of these sound effects are great. I love the sound of the of the missing and the hitting of the creatures. Some of the sound effects the creatures make are hilarious. <laughs> Ettens, in particular... Uh, sound like a there's like a group of people talking to each other, which is hilarious, which I find really funny, and it, it goes on for a little a little too long, I think. Anyway, in any case, if you're familiar with either Beholder or you watch me play it, this character screen should look very familiar. Each of these represents a different spot on your character's body where equipment is placed, chest armor, helmets, your main and offhand <laughs> items, and so on. We're gonna be hearing lots of creatures laughing. As we go through this game. I don't know how how much I should describe what we see on screen. But I think we'll talk about Dungeon Hack itself. For at least like another 10 minutes or so. And then I can go to talking about some other randomized stuff. This entire Let's Play. I'm dedicating this to my desire to talk to you guys about just life in general. Like Dungeons and Dragons stuff. And just have like a stream of consciousness. Because when I was doing that over on the Beholder, I felt like it was a bit inappropriate to do it there. Since I want to focus more on what's actually happening in the game there than just my notes that I ha might have in front of me. Or trying to talk about specific things about Dozens of Dragons, which then I'm not paying attention to what's happening on screen. And we'll talk about being a YouTuber and this sort of thing in the future as well over here on this playlist. Because, and I feel like this is the appropriate place to do it, because this game, after we've seen it played for about 10 minutes, you will have seen almost everything that this game basically offers you. So, I guess we'll, let's talk more about Dungeon Hack on, on that note. As you can see, we have a map displayed, and this game features an auto map. This is fantastic. I've, I like when games began to have an auto mapping feature added to them. Although I did really like making my own handmade maps when I was young, I've I've always appreciated that technology can be used to perform this task so I don't have to. And this game's auto map is rather nice. And the immediate details around us are also displayed, which is useful. Yep, so here's what a map looks like. Yep, I'm going to exit because I'm not really focusing on, I guess, showing you guys at home, which I, which is why I recorded this. What's going on in the game? Uh, in any case, something I do... I guess we'll talk a little bit about what I like about Dungeon Hack, since now we're playing it. It's a very simple game. Every The levels uh, have a start staircase and a bottom staircase. The game will generate three... Oh, anywhere from one to three types of creatures present on its levels. You won't ever meet more than that. 
one of the creatures, if it decides to spawn three of them, will be a singular creature that is considered the boss creature. It will. Ha it's just a normal monster. You might find it like like it might be anywhere from like a horrible like blob, like a living muck, for example, or a, a powerful golem, to something weak like a troglodyte or a bugbear. It all depends upon what level you're on. That way, it will make a stronger creature that you would encounter at a lower level show up, for example. Otherwise, you'd get either one or two normal creatures that you will encounter throughout the entirety of the dungeon level. In this case, we're fighting orcs. I think that's what we just killed right there. And hobgoblins, which are the red creatures with the two clubs. They'll be everywhere throughout this entire dungeon. It was one of the things that I wish was done a little differently. For the random creation of the dungeon, it's just the game just puts together a random dungeon for you. There are no... Aside from, I think... There's three types of procedurally generated dungeons that it makes. Ones that we're in right now, which is a randomized series of hallways and rooms. Uh, there's nothing particular special about any of these. Like, there's no sp very special set-aside room that has something unique about it. The game just chooses randomly what, like, this room's going to be a 3 by 3 foot room. I'll put some tapestries on the wall to match the tile set that's in here. Nothing else is in this room. There's another type of dungeon which gets created, which is a series of different teleporters, which brings you to other locations in the dungeon, which also have teleporters in them. And once you see once you see one of these dungeons, you generally have the have the layout of all of them and how those are created. Finally, there are labyrinth levels, which is just a series of hallways, no rooms, and these will almost always only have minotaurs as the only enemy which is present in them. Creatures. Do not drop random treasure, or rather, they they do, but it's not it's not randomized which creature drops treasure. A creature, if it's going to drop treasure, will dro has been decided that it will do so when the level gets created. So, respawns, for example, never drop anything. This isn't the same like I Beholder, where the Kenku would drop their quarter staffs or food rations. There's no food killing any respawn. There's no treasure that they drop either. Uh, respawns are respawns from whatever the, the dungeon normally generated. So if the dungeon generates whites that can level that can lower your level, for example, you really want to avoid bumping into respawns. The game will pop respawns into existence, to my knowledge, anywhere that they, as long as they are not visible, that spot on your map. So we could have a creature respawn behind, like that creature right there. I can tell that because it was facing a wall, the, the, it spawned it into existence at that spot. At least that's how, that's how I believe it works. So you can have a creature be placed behind you just as long as it's outside of the field of vision of your, of your character and or that map that we see uh, by us. For our cleric mage, we're gonna talk about this really quick. Mages in this game, cannot wear armor if they want to cast, or rather, mage spells have a requirement that you cannot be wearing armor. Only robes are allowed. You can have armor spells or protection spells in effect to lower your armor class, but you can't be wearing armor. I think I like this a bit better than it, how it worked in Eye of the Beholder. But I'm also not used to it. Something I like about this game is how everything is easily dis is like it's all displayed right here the exception being the camp interface where you rest recover spells and the map which you have a small version of it displayed for you down below i kind of wish it was a little bigger but this this is fine and everything else is it's right in front of you your equipment management is right here everything in your backpack you have three slots for uh, total for different backpack items Plus, whatever is equipped on your character. I thought this was really well done. And really, having played many, many more games now since this game had come out in the 1990s, I really appreciate the simplistic nature of the interface here. Again, everything is right at my fingertips. And everything is easily accessible. I think that's really phenomenal. 
because I have played games where it is really convoluted and complicated to get to certain aspects of the game. Um, let's think here. What's we talk about really quick? So I guess we'll talk about some things we're picking up. So this is a silver coin. Silver coins are used in this strange-looking. Uh, I'm going to call it an arcade machine, but that's not what it is. There'll be a device, we'll absolutely run into it at some point on this floor, and... Okay, uh, really quick, what I did right there is that you... another guaranteed item I forgot to mention you get on the first floor is an amulet of eminent return. It brings you back to the last spot on the map that you had teleported into. That in this case, that's always the st staircase that brought you down into this level. Or rather, the that would have brought you down into a new level. So, for example, the Amulet of Emmet Return will bring you back to the staircase up a floor if you were if you had descended down a floor. But if you had taken a teleporter, it will bring you back to where you had just entered the last teleporter from. In this case, because it's at level one, it brings us back to the starting staircase. That spirit, that spell I cast, by the way, and what you see me throwing that hammer, that's spiritual hammer. Uh, it's an amazing spell, and one I wish was inside either Beholder, but I don't think it is. You create a magic hammer, so that means it can hit creatures that can only be harmed by enchanted weapons. Your character throws it, so it's got, so you don't have to stand right in front of the creature, and it returns to your character, allowing you to re-throw it again. It also will hit a creature on its return. So you have multiple chances to hurt the creature as it passes through it. That's the thing I was talking about. That's the arc I call that an arcade machine. That looks nothing like it. And I'm not even going to use it because we're not hurt. But if we put the silver coin into that machine, we would be fully healed. There are two types of coins in the game. A silver coin and a gold coin. The gold coins, when using this machine, also heal you any st of any status effects. Like if you're poisoned or you're uh, maybe diseased or suffering from some sort of negative effect that can be purged, that will purge that negative effect. I, Master Survival, you have to remind me, if, assuming you're watching this, if that gets rid of your curses as well. I'm not sure it does. Right, so what else is going on, Tim? So, crap, I'm, I'm, I'm already out of things to talk about about the game. <laughs> I remember this game didn't get good reviews, I think, originally, because it, the graphics were rather simplistic. Uh, I think I rather prefer the graphics in even the Eye of Beholder series. I thought they were a little more detailed than this. I've heard that this is what the third Eye of the Beholder will look like. There is an illusionary passage here, I suspect, or a button somewhere that I'm missing. I think it's an illusionary wall. Illusionary walls in this game look exactly like normal walls, so I tend to realize there's one around. If either I see a creature in a wall, which then hints that that's where the secret walls uh, is, or I've explored and I haven't found, like, there's an area just like that that's missing. These levels that the dungeon makes, there it is, yep, there's Illusionary Wall. These dungeons that the love that the, uh, Dungeon Generator creates, will have every single spot filled out. Every single one of them. Assuming that, like, there isn't, like, a wall blocking an area. So, when I pop up the map again, I'll get a chance to describe it. But if you notice a larger than... Like, so, if you look at the map, you see our arrow, you can see we're on a, we're on a grid, then there's the wall, then there's another spot, there's another grid behind us. The wall, obviously, will never be filled in. But every other spot would be. So if it looks like there should be a room in a spot because there's nothing there but like empty space, there's totally something there. And you got to either find a, a button, a teleporter, or there's an illusionary wall somewhere adjacent to that empty area. And you got to bump into walls. You got to slam your face into them to find them. I do wish that the illusionary walls had been recognizable, either slightly translucent or some hint that it's not a real wall, like that it is illusionary, because it can be very frustrating. And the more illusionary walls you have present, the more time you're just going to be bumping into walls to find them. So I tend to leave them on, but just a setting of... 
this is me talk as if I play this game all the time. I I like having them on because it's something I have to be concerned about. But I, I only want a bare minimum of them here because I don't want to have to walk left and right as I bump into each walls in a hallway to see if they're... Okay, is there a illusionary wall to the left or right of me? No. Okay, how about this wall? You gotta push your face into each wall. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that very much. It's just... I'm, I'm done with that sort of thing. I much prefer wolves that have secret buttons on them that where I can stare at the wall carefully and notice them, like how Legend of Grimrock did it. Whew. Yeah, take it, Hobgoblin. <laughs> All our items are going blue because I, or m many of them are, because I cast a Detect Magic. Uh, this is something I like about the game too, in that uh, Detect Magic also, like you saw this in Eye of the Beholder, but it also worked this way if, in this game, if an item is placed on the ground. We would see the glow of it even on the ground, which is not something that was occurring in Eye of the Beholder. And I like that change. It means that I can just ignore anything on the ground. If it's a weapon and not magical, you're not going to want to pick it up. Or very, very, very rarely would you ever want to carry a non-magical weapon with you. The only thing reason I can think of to do that in this game is because you don't have a backup weapon. And preferably you're going to want two or three backup weapons, hopefully they're magical, in order to deal with living mucks, which is, I think, is the only creature in this entire game series which eats your weapons. You hit, you hit it, it with a weapon. There's a chance the muck devours that weapon, and you're not. And there's only a, a there's a chance you get it back, but it's not a hundred percent. And I hated levels filled with these things <laughs> because they can be one of the two enemies that get get to get spawned on you. When it comes to spawning the enemies, you you do begin to encounter tougher and tougher creatures down below. The first, like, two or three floors, the first two floors are generally not anything too difficult. Starting at floor three and lower, it gets a lot tougher. I think at level three is when you can begin encountering Zill, I think is what they're called. Though they tend to only be on one floor level, which are a really annoying, very fast, multiple attack, paralyzing, causing enemy. And at starting, I think, at level 3, you will begin encountering undead. And these undead, some of, if the game decides to, you'll be fighting, like, whites. And these, and, or worse. There might be, I think, wraiths can't spawn until level 4. But these things, these things lower your, your levels. They level drain you. Oh, and that's rough. This is another reason to play a cleric, because they get a spell called Negative Plane Protection, which, if you're hit by an undead, will zap that undead and stop it from applying any special effect it would otherwise apply to you when it hits you. But then the effect expires. Still, it will be very useful to have them. The game it can be a bit unfair, and you'll see this in one, at least one of the later videos, because we'll go down a staircase... And there'll be a white right there waiting to attack you. <laughs> and, and guess what? If it hits you, you're level drained. And so uh, that sucks. Or you could you could uh, go downstairs. There could be like a cockatrice down there. It attacks you. It hits you. You're petrified. You're dead. Your game's erased. If you had that if you had that option set. So it's it's a bit unfair in that regard. But I think that was what adds the charm with how simple this game is. Some other aspects. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk, I guess, a whole lot about the game we're currently playing in this episode and the next one. I have a I have like eight pages of things to talk about, but I, I probably not I'm not gonna get to them uh, in this video because I, I want to focus on the game because I was impressed by how much I liked it, but it also I also remembered a lot about it correctly. I feel in that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not the best roguelike I've played. I'd, I'd hesitate, I hesitate to say this a bit because I'd, I have to sit down to actually review it properly, which is, I'm not doing that today. But it's, it's not the worst roguelike I've played, but it's a far cry from the best one I've played. Almost every other roguelike I have played is better than Dungeon Hack. But there's a certain there's a certain charm that this game has, which I do like. It is it is simple. It's easy to get into a groove playing it, and I don't mind how it, re repetitious it is. This is a great game 
to put on. You don't really have to think very much. You can just put on like a podcast or have something else going on in the background. Or you just run around and just kill bugbears, troglodytes, or undead in this game while looking to get food and get and get your numbers up when you level up. It's it's good for what it is, and it gives you a good taste of what roguelikes can be like. There's the grappling hook. I can't remember if I pick it up. Since I have pits disabled, we do oh, we don't need it. Something else I like about this game. On our map, it shows us, obviously, where the enemies are. They are the red squares. But it also shows us if there's an item on the ground in the form of a very t of a small blue dot. Useful to let you know if you've left something around. Maybe, maybe you were peeking through a, a window or an area that you can't actually walk through. And there's an item there, and you realize, oh, I can't make out what that is, but I definitely want to at least check that. Unfortunately, you cannot write on this map, nor are there any symbols you can leave on it. So, you will see me leaving things on the ground to have that blue dot present on it, so I, rem so I can tell that there's something there that might interest me later. <laughs> Now, another thing I like about this game are the doors, which is going to be a bit weird to talk about, but not every creature can open doors. Uh, in fact, it most of the time makes sense as to which creatures can or cannot open doors. An ankeg, which is like a burrowing centipede-like creature, uh, doesn't have hands and won't be able to open doors, so you can leave them in a room, and you will see me constantly shutting doors because if there's respawns and the and the creatures on the level consist of things which which can't open doors I'm go Ooh, we're almost dead we're almost dead do I die I can't remember if I die and I have to and I restart to Meg I think I'm probably the hit chances in this game. <laughs> they, now, to, to be fair to the game, it's because of second edition Dungeons and Dragons Stacko, so uh, so I shouldn't expect a great chance to hit. It is a magical flail though, so I'm hoping that it's uh, at least a plus. I mean, it's got to be plus one if it's ma or cursed, or cursed, but I don't think it's cursed. In this game, by the way, unlike Eye of the Beholder, resting to recover hit points significantly drains your hunger, your that food bar of yours. It's much more noticeable in this game. And in this game, I have rested with, like, a fighter for 280 hours. <laughs> just, just insane that I spent 10 days sitting in a spot in the dungeon to heal my character fully. Oh my goodness, what the heck? I need to find either a Ring of Sustenance for my fighter, or I need to find a Ring of Regeneration, which would solve... Uh, either one would solve those issues. All right, I've explored all the dungeon. I think. Am I... Oh, and I did take the... The grappling hook, okay. Now, you'll note I dropped my mace and took the flail. The Whatever weapons you, you start with... You don't... It's not a magical weapon. So, w we found this weapon, and it is magical, and it's not cursed, because I was able to take it off my, my hand slot. To check if an item is cursed or not, if your character doesn't have... Actually, for any character, you, sh you should do this. Put the weapon, assuming it's not something like a dagger or a short sword that can be wielded in your offhand, put it in your offhand. Uh, in this case, it's the items, the hand slot to the right where our holy symbol currently is. Your character will not be considered carrying it if it's something like a mace or a short sword. And this will let you identify it, which is what you're going to see me do with this improved identify spell. Oh, okay. I'm going to cast Chill... Why, why am I casting Chill Touch? That's an... Okay. Well, okay. So, because we... Am I not going to identify the flail? Did I already identify it and I just didn't realize it? I guess I I guess I've identified it. So, all right. When we have a spell like oh, by the way, there is copy protection, but the copy protection has been disabled by Gog. So you can type anything you want in it, and you'll automatically pass the copy protection. You would get asked that question when you go down from level one to level two. 
holy crap, we've talked for like 30 minutes already, and I've almost focused exclusively on the game mechanics of this game. <laughs> Throwing hammer, we'll add that to the pile of items I'm going to want to identify. So, balance-wise, um, the game heavily favors... So, I found this interesting playing the game again. It is a bit better balance than I remember it being. Most of the time, in this type of game that we're playing, a real-time grid-based dungeon crawl, uh, I find that it's I do well in beating things up. Like, moving, attacking, moving away. And this heavily favors melee combat. We gained only one hit point, but I'm going to play this game like a roguelike, so I'm not going to reload despite the fact that we gained one hit point as a cleric, which is like the least amount we could pop. Yeah, we have a constitution of 15, which means we rolled a 1 or a 2 for hit points, and we have a D8 we could have rolled. Uh, but I, I've already... We'll talk more about Dungeons and Dragons systems, second edition ones, a little bit later, and why I heavily modified my game. Probably the next video. Um, Crap! I was talking about something and I forgot what I was talking about. So I guess we'll go back to talking about uh, hand slots. and uh, Oh, right. Uh, cursed items. So, unbalance. So, mages, unless you're playing a triple class, a like a half-elf fighter mage cleric, you will start with an improved identify spell, which is one of the most useful, if not the most useful spell you can get in this game. Because you will be told what these items do. This game has cursed items, which is great because it's a roguelike, right? Roguelikes have cursed items in it. They have items which are garbage that you don't ever want to pick up. They have potions that you never want to drink. And a big portion of the game is finding out what these things do. <laughs> so a class in this game who is able to figure out what these things do because of an identify spell and being very clever with how you give your character these items so that they can identify them uh, safely is very powerful. So mages have that going for them. Now, a pure mage class, though, has the worst two-hit chance of all the classes in the 2nd edition Dungeons & Dragons, which means that what you see me doing with Meg, moving up, attacking, moving away, strafing side to side to stop the creatures from attacking me, can take a very long time for them to do. They rely heavily upon their damaging spells to take, to take out enemies. But because this game uses the spell memorization mechanic... Oh, right. This is, so this is a troglodyte. It looks, I know it looks like a lizard man. This is a troglodyte. And when they attack you with their spear, there's a chance, I think their spears are like tipped with poison, that your character will lose one strength. I should have actually used the coin so I could show you what this what this thing does. I guess I'll, I'll come back to that later. So on this floor, we see troglodytes, and I thought it was bugbears were the other item. Uh, the chill touch spell you see me casting, I, I do like it. It's very useful for a pure mage. Although his hit chances are awful, it does a great deal of damage more than a staff would do. I think it's... What is it? Is it 2d4? Damage, and there's a chance it will fear the enemy. You see this thing... You see these enemies flashing twice. That's because it's being damaged once, and then it attempts to apply a fear effect to the creature to make it run away. In any case, this spell also lasts for a while. So, if you're a mage... This is going to be one of the main ways you were able to deal with creatures early on. If if you can find it, right, that's something, another another balance issue I don't like about Dungeon Hack is, is that you have to find all your spells. Like, you don't get to say what you want your spell book to have at different levels. Your character didn't come in here with that knowledge. He starts with whatever spells were in his spell book, which are always going to be, like, Detect Magic, Magic Missile, Burning Hands, and Armor, if you're a pure mage for level 1. At level 2, I think you get Melf's Acid Arrow and Identify. And at level 3, if your character is a pure mage, you'll start with Fireball. Everything else you have to find. Which means that if if your mage reaches level like 9, and you haven't found any level 
four spells. You're not casting any. <laughs> so it's a bit it's a very unforgiving game in that regard. But I suppose that's again that adds to its charm because it it's it's tough. It's tough and people like that. Which is and they should. <laughs> they should like it. I I wanna sound I wanna make it I don't wanna make it sound like this is always a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, actually, I actually think I like that you don't get guaranteed spells, but it does make it frustrating uh, at certain time at certain points. Now, if you before you go out and rush out to buy this game, there's a few other things I want to point out about it that I really hold against this game. There is some lag, some input lag, which occasionally occurs. You might, for say, like cast a spell, or the enemy might cast a spell at you, and the game will pause as it does so. This can get you killed very quickly. Like, let's say that there's two whites side by side, and you cast a fireball. The game pauses while you do that, but the enemies will move up and attack you. And there's a chance, like, they, if it's a creature that can kill you with its attack, you might die to it. Or you will risk being hit by a creature that you wouldn't otherwise be hit by. This occurs even sometimes when you're not doing anything like strenuous that the game engine would have problems with. Like, you could just move forward and the game might lag. And suddenly there's a creature in front of you. Oh crap, it's a, it's a Medusa. Oh my god, it's moved up and attacked me. Thankfully it missed. And you will see that occur several times here in this series going forward, where game just decides to lag on me, and there's nothing I can do but pray I don't die outright to some of these creatures that we'll be fighting later on. Uh, what's another huge issue? Because there's like two or three of them that I have. The, the lag in particular is one of the most painful things uh, with this game. The respawn, as I, as I mentioned, uh, is also a bit unfair, especially on floors where it takes a long time to chew through some of these creatures. Uh, I think at some point, one of my characters, because I'm playing through the game with multiple, multiple people to see if I remember more about the, the game mechanics correctly, uh, encountered a floor with slug ogres and Medusa. And, oh, the respawns were just through the roof. And it kept, it would spawn these creatures sometimes behind me. Like, just out of my character's line of sight. And I would back up to avoid a Medusa walking forward. Only to see on my map a red dot two spaces behind me that wasn't there a few seconds ago. I roll around to see another Medusa. And then I'm equipping my Amulet of Emmet Return to disappear. It, it feels a bit like the how the Overlord would spawn things in the Descent board game. And it, in a game like this, where these creatures just can kill you outright, man, that's really unforgiving. I don't like that very much. Again, adds to difficulty, and arguably adds to the charm of a roguelike, but it feels very unfair. I, I don't like that very much. Uh, sometime, so in this game, just like I the Beholder as well, by the way, when creatures attack you, the moment they're in their attack animation, unless you kill them, their attack will be rolled against you. So in other words, if you're not standing in front of it as it swings its spear, but it began to swing its spear, you will still be struck by it if the creature rolls well enough to hit you. So... Uh, keep that in mind as well if you run up to pick this game. You might think that you're nowhere near the creature, and you're not, but the game doesn't care. It's gonna ha If that creature gets to attack you, it will do so. Some creatures, I do now this part I do like, there's creatures that, that move and attack very quickly compared to others. Trolls, for example, and troglodytes move much faster than something like a bugbear or a mummy moves. So, okay, back to character balance. So, the mages in this game, although they gain improved identify, which is an extraordinarily useful spell to have in a game like this, a roguelike, they're very fragile. They can't take very many hits. And something that wouldn't be very scary for a fighter, like a troll, 
could very quickly kill a mage, unless he's very careful with his movement. Mages also rely on their spells in this game quite substantially to get to chew through very dangerous enemies very quickly. If you're not willing to spend five real-life minutes trying to kill something like a bugbear because you keep missing with your stupid staff, because <laughs> you didn't find a chill touch spell, and you don't want to have to rest again to cast a burning hands and do some damage to it. This means that mages are going to go through their food faster to make up for the fact that they have uh, this power with their fireball spells, for example, or ice storm, or other like word of death spells, for example. And I, I like that. I think it's, I think it's balanced rather well in that regard. Fighters have the best hit chances, and so even though they're going to go through the game without any natural healing, unless they find something to assist them in that regard. Oh, we found something that gave Meg, Meg Bennett a little bit of strength. So that. That ring we have is a ring of strength, and it's given her an 18 slash 1 strength. Staff of Striking plus 3. Very nice. One of the best staff staves in the game. You, so, uh, I'll talk really quick about, once again, why you see me putting these items in, in my character's left hand. It's because it's not considered equipped. And to identify an item, you have to have it in your hand to identify it. So if the item's cursed, my character won't keep it equipped because they're not considered actually carrying it. So this is how you safely identify items. So the back to the fighter, he's got a lot of hit points, can wear any type of armor he wants, and has the best hit chances in the game, normally, as his Thacko decreases, which means his chance of hit creatures decreases as he goes up levels. So... He's the best suited if you want to play the melee combat game of this grid-based real-time dungeon crawler. And generally, that's what most people want to do. So he gives you the best feeling in that regard. Clerics are a bit of an in-between. They have a lot of buffs. Their hit chances are the, they're the second best in the game, but they're a far cry from what the fighters is. They also, however, have the least concern about the food meter, because at level 5, they get access to create food, which removes that as, as a concern. For Meg Bennett, my plan here is to not take create food, and I'll still try to rely on the food I'm finding going forward with her instead. This game also has issues because... Well, balance issues because, just like in Eye of the Beholder, many spells are simply not useful whatsoever. Uh, there's the Dispel Magic spell, which as far as I can tell, just removes all the buffs you have on your, your, your hero. It doesn't do anything against any of the enemies, to my recollection. This game has a spell called Remove Paralysis, which would normally do exactly what it, it sounds like, but your character can't cast it if they're paralyzed, for example. There are spells like Hold Person, which don't work on monsters, and very few creatures in this game count as persons it will affect. Many of these spells you get access to, like Magic Vestment, a third level cleric spell that gives your armor class of, I think it's five, is useless by the time you get access to it because you will likely have found Magic Armor, which renders it as a pointless spell to actually have. And there's quite a few spells of this sort where they're not very useful or extremely situational. And just as I mentioned when I was reviewing 2nd Edition Dungeons & Dragons, it, it brings to light how unbalanced some of this is. Now, again, however, uh, for most of this game, you probably won't care. And once once, once you realize what spells are useful versus which ones are not, you just take the useful ones. And as a roguelike, this is perfectly fine. You you want your character to, be, to go down to the lowest level, you play like a... you play a cleric, you take whatever spells you think are useful for you to get down there. You realize the, hey, these spells aren't use, are useless, but these ones are really su stupidly powerful. I'm going to take the stupidly powerful ones and get down to the end and win. <laughs> I think because... I think because of what this game is... It's fine that it's balanced the way it is. Oh, so a heads up, by the way, when it comes to creatures. In this game, creatures strafe as well. They can strafe just like you do. But they'll only do it, they will only strafe, if strafing would allow them to immediately attack you after they do so. 
a creature, when it moves, will attack immediately if it is right there, for example, if you were in front of it after it moved. Otherwise, it has to wait a few seconds to do so. This is why you see me trying to keep, like, one, uh, two spaces away from creatures at all times. Because it will move up. I'm not in front of it. Then I, then I move up and attack it and then move away. I can't believe we've been talking about 45 minutes. I mean, I've only talked about Dungeon Hack and I spent two hours a day <laughs> writing eight pages of notes of things to talk about. The next episode will do that, I suppose. Some other things about this game. So I, I guess I'm giving it I'm giving it a partial review, but I'm not giving it a score at the moment. I'm trying to be fair with 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 my statements here. Uh, whenever it whenever it comes to opening a door, in the vast majority of cases, we're talking like 99.999 percent of the cases, the thing that you need to interact with is directly by the door in some fashion. So if you see a door, there's no button, there's no lock, there's right next to it somewhere, there's a hidden button. This is the case in, I, I, I want to actually say it's like 100% of the time. And I wish that the game was a little more clever when it came to placing secret buttons. On that same note, though, if they did it that way, they, it could place a secret button for a door nowhere near where that door is. Which would, which would mean that you'd have to run up and down the hallway staring at each wall to see where that button is located so on one hand it's a little too simple based on how they designed it here on the other hand it does remove quite a bit of frustration and uh, tedium in trying to find where these buttons i heard something attack this must be like a yep it's it's a dart uh, trap behind this bugbear there's a face on the wall that's probably shooting darts darts add a bit of lag as well uh, even if you're not looking at them, it will add lag to the room, which means that these bugbears will be a little more tricky to fight than normal. I always thought these things look like Spock. <laughs> they're angry, angry faced the way their eyebrows are and their pointed ears. These are just giant weightlifting Spocks, Vulcans, here in the here in Does the Dragons. Other things I wish this game had done, uh, but again, it's it's a very simple game and it's it's fine for what it is. Uh, I wish this game had specialized rooms that had a chance to show up. Uh, so this is more of a critique, I suppose, against a game that features that is heavily influenced or designed with procedurally generated content, and that after a while you will recognize everything. Star crawlers, for example, in the random maps that you go on, after you've been in, in a map, after you've done a certain map, you've explored a certain type of thematic dungeon, like two times, you will begin to recognize the layout of this dungeon. You will know where the things are that you can interact with, where the traps are located, and so on. And it begins to become repetitious, and will begin to feel, I feel, a little grindy in that regard. I like it when there are there is more of a handcrafted experience. Starcrawlers actually did this rather well because you have the random maps, but then you also have maps which were designed like specifically and have a certain theme to them. Or rather, I'm sorry, uh, every every hallway was placed there by the map editors and designers. It wasn't they didn't rely on the game engine to create these. They made them. This way, there's a more tailored experience there. An example of where I feel this game could have gone down a better route would have been Diablo 1. Or maybe, yeah, I think Diablo 1? Diablo 2 might have been worked this way too. It's been a while. Where in Diablo 1, for example, there was the room that had King Leoric in it. And you weren't guaranteed to find that room. Because it would randomly decide what rooms or level layouts you would get. But when you found that room, it was designed specifically with the King Leoric encounter in mind. Uh, you would encounter him as a specific unique enemy that you would meet. And the level looked a certain way compared to all the other random levels. I kind of wish this had done the same thing. Where the 
level layout. All right, it, it's fine that we have like several levels in a row where it's just you know big rooms. Might be something interesting in it. Probably isn't anything in interesting in it. Random hallways, but having something very specific or like a unique puzzle to try to solve on a certain floor or level. I think would add a bit more flavor to it and make this feel a little less repetitious than what it's going to feel like. <laughs> playing the game, once again, after like the first hour of playing it, I was basically ignoring everything that wasn't the creature in the room and just looking for treasure. Uh, although I do like, now I do like the tile sets they have here and I like the uh, dungeon dressing. Uh, that they have here as well, like the, the banners, the posters, and stuff like that. I think they did a good job uh, uh, on this. And the fact that these levels do look different helps add to some of the uniqueness when you're going through them. It's not all exactly the same. Uh, I think that would have been a real detriment to the game. Uh-oh, Tim, your door's shut. You better get out of there. Only issue with, with Spiritual Hammer is that if it misses, you gotta wait for it to come back to your hand. The Spiritual Hammer will fly through walls, however, to reach you after you throw it. If you don't have a free hand slot, then it will go into your inventory. You can cast it twice and then dual wield Spiritual Hammers. <laughs> it's something I used to do a long time ago. I'm not doing it here, but you can do so. Another way if you identify items, such as potions or wands, is to use them. And generally, you will see what effect it is. Sometimes it doesn't work for potions. If the potion's effect is like neutralizing poison and nothing happens, your character won't know that it's a neutralized poison potion. But if it's like a, a potion of that like fills you up with, with food, your character will remember that going forward. Like all roguelikes, or the vast majority of them, uh, things are color coded, and what a potion, a red potion, does in one dungeon might be vastly different from what it does in another dungeon. I do like something else about this game is that it tracks that for you, so that you don't have to write down red potion equals healing potion. If you drink a, po a red potion and it heals your hit points, and it was a healing potion, the next red potion you pick up will be labeled healing potion as opposed to just red potion. Yeah, so the, so we're almost out of time, everyone. I can't believe it's been almost an hour. What the hell? <laughs> but uh, I find that if I had to give a summary about Dungeon Hack, now that I've recorded a few episodes of this, and I intend to beat the game with a character. I don't want to ruin if Meg dies or not. And the, by the way, that was a were-rat that we just killed. Were-rats require magic items. And I've only got another two and a half minutes until I'm done with this episode. Um... I feel it would be fair to indicate that this game has things I like, but overall is probably a game that I can't recommend. It would be similar to Occult Chronicles. I feel overall there's a lot here to like. There's a lot here that is grindy or I wish was done a little differently. I can't really hold it against it, but I I don't... I don't like how some of this works. The lag, in particular, when it comes to input and combat, can get you killed, and that's unforgivable. I think it's a bit samey and a bit repetitious and grindy. But these days, I put on something else. In, I can put on something else in the background and listen to that as I play this game, and I don't mind the grind whatsoever. It can be fun to play a game like I, like I do for Grim Dawn. Or just have it on the background, and I'm running around just slaughtering everything. Nothing gives me too much trouble, because I'm, I haven't gone up to the increased difficulty yet. And I just have fun listening to people talk in the background about random stuff while I'm, uh, while I'm playing the game. I feel that the game's not balanced very well. Uh, there's no story, though. The game's interface is is good. It's it's has a lot of theme for 2nd Edition Dungeons & Dragons. But if I had to give it a score... Just like Occult Chronicles, it probably end up at the same spot that Occult Chronicles is at for different reasons. To say it doesn't wouldn't get a high score, but it's it's a it's I don't regret playing the game as it were. I hope that makes sense. And Master Survival, if you stop by here, I hope I'm being a little more fair uh, to this game. I do feel that this is a good introduction to the. The rogue-like genre. And it's it's a 
great look back at one of the first ones of these that I ever played. Because I've never played NetHack or Adam or things of that sort when I was growing up. This was the first one of these I ever played. And everyone, we've got 25 seconds left. I can't believe I didn't talk about any other random things but this game. But the good news is now we're done talking about Dungeon Hack for an entire hour. I feel like I probably should have reviewed it. <laughs> and the next one of these, I can talk about random stuff. Random stuff. I'm doing that to indicate that we're done. We're done. All right, everyone. So thank you guys for watching. If you did watch and listen to me ramble on about this game, hopefully I was a little more fair in it. And I will see you guys in the next one where I will actually talk about putting together a Dungeon Dra Dragon campaign. See you guys then. Thanks for watching again.